All right, welcome to another installment of Todd's Video Games and More. This one was a doozy. This is going to be the restoration video of the 1982 Disney arcade classic Tron. When I bought this, it was nothing but a shell of a game, and over the past six months, I have found all the parts for it, figured out how to make them work together, got it wired up, and now I've got it back to its original glory. So I hope you enjoy it, because this is one of my favorite videos. So I'm still going to go for this trashed, worthless 1982 Midway Tron junk cabinet. Let's go 65. Outbid. Ninety five. Outbid. One twenty five. Winning. All right. So someone has met the challenge. Now I have to bid one seventy five. So this is starting to get a little on the costly side. Five, four, three, two, one. Did I win it? I think I did. <laughs> All right. It's about 7.30 in the morning. We've got the truck loaded up. Got a tarp, got a blanket. Got some snacks. We're gonna drive this thing out today all the way over to Atlanta, Illinois to pick up another arcade game. Journey begins. It's really not that bad. I think I'm with you. It's <laughs> it's got some some charm. Well, so. yeah. I mean, it's it's not the worst I've had. I can tell no. you that. I mean, at least the side art is. Let me get a dollar behind it. What do you think? <laughs> there's no there's no retakes, it's fine.
could be rain. At least it's snow. Snow. Okay, it's home, it's in the garage. It stayed in one piece, sort of. <laughs> as one piece as it started out anyway. And before long, I'll start the restoration. The video game industry has now even given birth to its own motion picture, Tron where a young computer genius is trying to break into a massive computer system. It's because, man, somewhere in one of these memories is the evidence. So the young computer genius tries and gets zapped by a ray gun right into the machine and onto the computer-generated game grid to meet characters who are alter egos of their creators and to a place where, according to the movie ads, love and escape do not compute. Naturally, there is a Tron machine on the market now, four games in one, ray guns and all. If there's been a mistake, I gotta see the guy in charge. You will. In terms of the arcade video game, the guy in charge is not in Hollywood. Tron's big brother is in suburban Chicago at the Valley Corporation's Midway plant. Here they are turning out Tron games as fast as they can. These workers are under so much pressure, company executives asked us not to spend too much time shooting the factory for fear it would slow the workers. That gives you some idea how competitive the business is. Incidentally, the Valley Company is the same one who gave us Pac-Man, Ms. Pac-Man, Space Invaders, Defenders, and Asteroids. On the average, it can take up to two years and several hundred thousand dollars to get a video game from the drawing board to the arcade. In between, there are secret testing locations and programming changes. This is the Tron in a box, two boxes actually, that I got from another collector. And I've popped them open and it's time to unpack and see what kind of Tron goodies that we have. And well, there's a piece of the monitor bezel. Here we have the operating manual. This is a fluorescent fixture, maybe the black light fixture. And we have the rest of this piece, and uh, that's hopefully what these two go to because, and they are, they already knew these were broken. They were broken in the photo. And then laying down here on the bottom, we have one of the front sections. And then we have the tinted plexiglass that goes over the monitor. Trans light that goes behind the screen, and it doesn't look so great. It's got some pretty big warps. Come on, big fella, let's see what you got. I'd like to go against you and see what you're made of. You know, you don't look a thing like your pictures. I'm warning you. You're entering a big era, Flynn. I'm gonna have to put you on the game, Brett. Game? You want games? I'll give you games. <laughs> inside the first big box and we have 
collect the power board and then the main three board stack for the game here. So those survive nicely. Looks like we have coin door on top. There's the big transformer assembly, the big power block, kind of the suitcase, I think some people call it, that will sit at the base of the cabinet. So we'll just leave it in this box for now. So I got the bottom busted out, which took one mild hit from the hammer, and now the whole thing is opened up. Hey, All right, so I got it cleaned up a little bit. We've got a solid edge in there. If we can use that for our frame, then we'll be okay because we can do the rest cosmetically. All right, so I've got the measurements lined up for the bottom back section and we've got the cutouts for the casters on the back or the wheels on the back and a cutout at the top for the power cord so we'll make those next All right, so I've got this particle board pretty well cleaned up, as much debris off as I can. I want to go ahead and clamp down the new piece we've made for the base and for the back. Before I do that, I'm going to use some wood hardener on it. So the wood hardener is going to soak right into all these little bits and pieces of solid dust down through here and give us a nice firm surface again so that we don't have it just rip apart when we try to put it together. The wood hardener is great, but it doesn't go very far. It takes a lot of wood hardener because it will really soak into this stuff. But I'm just going to go all around all the edges, everywhere that I see. It makes a great waterproofer. It's going to give this some more stability here. All right, now I'm going to take some wood glue. I'm going to take the piece that goes on the back here, and I'm going to go ahead and put a line of bead on it. Now this is not going to hold the back and the bottom on, but I do want it as filled in as I can and as tight as I can before I try to brace it on the inside. So I'm going to start with some wood glue. So here we are after one night, I've let this set with the wood glue in place, I got the clamps in place, I've measured it out. We're basically the same width from here to here as we are from here to here and here to here. 
which is very close to the same width we are at the very back of the cabinets, within almost an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch, which is fantastic. So I'm going to work on some bracing for the inside of this so that I can take these clamps off, and then we can go to the other end down there and work on it. All right, so here we are on the inside of it. You can see we've got the edges pretty good. There's a little light showing through, especially in the front, but not much on the sides. And that's solid wood up against it. I put some wood hardener up there. Um, there's a few chips out of it, but that's in really good shape. And if we come down around the corner here to the bottom, we can see that that wood, the particle board that we're going to be attaching to, is also pretty uh, structurally sound. So I think we're in good shape here. Right, so this is actually the bottom of the cabinet in the back and this is one side and that's the other side and that's the front of the cabinet up there. So now I've got everything braced and in place and it's time to start bringing that in uh, to get that edge finished up. And we definitely have our work cut out for us getting this piece back into position. It's really swollen. Uh, the top of it is sticking out compared to the bottom. It's pulling the entire half of that channel out for the T-molding. And the bottom is not much better. It looks about the same from the other side. So I'm gonna chip away some of this stuff and uh, it's about time to take these clamps off and see if this side is going to stay. Now I've been cranking down on it a little bit at a time and it didn't take long that is already looking much better if we go from the other side we can see this really straightening out from this view I guess the further back I get the better but it's looking better um, we've still got this channel to punch back in up here but I want to do it separately because it's going to stick out a little more than this does so I had to have the pressure on this and not that now we have tons of clamps clamps all over the place because this front section is pretty bowed out or was and so I had to get a couple extra boards on it just to get it straightened out and so you can see now that that's pretty straight. Now this is too wide through here it's much wider than what the eventual T-molding will be and that's because we have so much particle board inside of here that we can't quite squeeze it together so I'm going to take this drill and I'm going to drill out little sections of this so that we can close the gap a little better. I'm going to take some wood glue and all these shavings and I'm going to make a putty out of them to put back in to fill in the gaps. We've got that clamped in place, just like that. You can see all the new fibers in there. It doesn't have to be perfect. We're still gonna go on the outside of it and do some additional work. But we're exactly 24 and three quarters wide all the way to the very bottom, which is perfect.
right, so we're heading to Chicago, and we're going to pick up a working monitor pulled from a Tron and bring it back home and see if it'll work. Got this thing loaded in best I can. Hopefully not where it's gonna break, but uh, we're gonna take this baby back home. Now I may have been distracted for the last month or so working on this pole position, getting it up and running, but now it's Tron's day to shine once again. And it's time to finally finish the bottom base of this cabinet. So I've got the cabinet upside down, just like that. And I'm going to climb a little ladder here. And what I've done is I have cut a piece of wood the right length across there, and I've taped it on the inside so nothing will stick. And I've made a channel to pour some fiberglass resin down into to make the front of this cabinet. All right, so this is the first pour. This is four ounces of fiberglass resin. What I did was I chopped up some bits of the particle board that had fallen off of it and I pushed them down into the channel as I was pouring in the fiberglass resin. So it's not a final pour because we will have to get back up to level there. Some of it's close to level, but it's enough to get it all in there nice and solid. We'll let this set up and then we'll put a top coat over. Well, now I have a resin and little bits of particle board edge. I'll be able to sand that down. I've got the other sides to do which aren't nearly as bad as the front. And then these sides right here, and you can see my extra resin that's kind of dripped down. All right, on upside down Tron, we now have a pretty good base all the way around. Fairly sharp lines. I've got some spots to fill in here and there and to smooth down a little bit more. We've got the corners to do in the front and the back uh, and the channels that go with them that the T-molding goes in. That I will probably use Bondo for because the resin is just too runny. It gets into everywhere. I need something a little thicker that I can mold. All right, it's Bondo time. Either you love it or you hate it, or you love it and hate it, which is what I do. So I like the results, but I hate using it. There's really not a lot of trickery that goes on with Bondo. It's really pretty straightforward, and I like the high bond filler. You just take a blob of it out like that. Don't need to get a ton of it each time. You don't have to do the whole thing at once. Matter of fact, it's usually better to do just a little at a time. We'll put a little bit of this hardening cream on. If you put too much on, it hardens fast. If you don't put enough on, then it takes a long time to harden. Sometimes it doesn't harden, which I've had happen before, and I've had to scrape it all back off. And you're just going to mix it back and forth with your spatula, and hopefully you've got a really bad spatula like this one that you can use just for Bondo mixing and application. And we're just going to run it back and forth until we don't have any blue streaks. We've got Oh, about five minutes of good working time with this. The very beginning, it flows in really nicely. And then after a while, it gets a little more putty-like and hard to get it to shape where you want. So, we've got our Bondo here. Down into the groove up here. We've got a big open channel, and I'm just going to scrape it down into it. Because we want it to flow down into the bottom and not have any big voids of air inside. All 
All right, I'm back off my little hand cart that I got yesterday, and now I've got it back on the sawhorses. And you can see you got each of these edges. Looking pretty darn good, I'm happy with that. Now, next, the front, ugh. So I may have to turn this on its back and uh, start working on that. All right, so I've been working on that pole position back there and it's up and running now. So back to more work on the Tron and it's time to do the Bondo in the front. And the front is just a wreck. So I've taped off areas where I don't want the Bondo to uh, stick because I want to have a little bit of a ledge between the T-molding and the edge and the front section there. And I've got what remains of a can of Bondo. I hope it's enough. And I'm gonna mix them up and put it on there. I would love to have this uh, not sideways while working, but the shape of the Tron is such that there's no real good way to lay it on its back. So I'm gonna work on this one sideways, do my best, try not to kill my back today. And this is what it looks like with the little sanding and little patching work. I'm also starting to go over the front of this, trying to get a little more even. It's swollen here and there, but um, I don't know, it looks pretty good. Now it's time to do a little more body work on this thing and to fill in all these low spots or spots where I'm down into the particle board, some things like this and uh, bad areas like that. And what I've got is this Bondo glazing and spot putty and some Bondo spreaders. And this is basically the same process as using, using the Bondo, but you don't mix it. And this will set on its own, but you can't use it for anything really deep or really big like we did on these corners, but it is good for starting to fill in the surface areas, the little imperfections. So that's the next step. Okay, I've got a couple layers of the Bondo glazing putty on this. It's still, I can feel it's uneven and it's not completely finished, but it's close enough now that I need to go ahead and get this thing up, upright so I can move it around and do some other work on it. So the next step on this is I've got my router here with a blade that's made perfect for this T molding. And the way it's gonna work is I'm gonna run right down through here and make a channel exactly the same as the other. Now it's important with this to go from the right direction because this spins counterclockwise and you want the blade eating down into the groove that you're making, not pop out of the groove you're making. Otherwise you can pop a bunch of this Bondo out really quickly. It also makes a ton of dust. So I'm gonna have a leaf blower blowing the dust away from me. All right, so I got a nice channel through here. I was a little nervous going very far across the back because I am kind of cutting through the part that's holding it in place. So we're not gonna go all the way across with the T molding. We're gonna cut it a little short. Um, this one's fine too. Down here, got a little away from me, start cutting down through there. So I had to stop and go back and recenter and get it back across. So I'll have to fill that back in. Um, over here, I had an entire corner pop out, so I may not have had enough Bondo up in there and just had a weak spot and it popped it out, but that's okay. We'll fill it back in and we will do this section again. All right, all repaired and recut, so that's all done. Now what I'm gonna do next is do a little painting because we're gonna put some T-molding in here eventually and we wanna go ahead and get this painted all the way back to here so I can put wheels on the bottom and put this thing upright and not have to deal with the bottom anymore.
command. I can't stand all this commotion. What do you want? All right, so I've got the bottom looking good, all nice and painted, nice and protected. I've got these wheels from Lowe's that I bought that I like to use. They're 125 pounds per wheel, so they're plenty heavy duty. I've set them in the positions about where the leg leveler or holes would be. So if somebody wants to sometime, they can pop these off, they can drill the leg leveler holes, put the leg levelers on, get rid of these. But I have all my games on carpet, these sink down into the carpet. I can roll them around, rearrange when I need to. So I prefer, prefer to have the casters. So I've taken a little sharp tool and I've made a little mark, a little indentation where I want the pilot holes to be for each one of these. So I'm going to drill them in and then we're going to screw these things on. Wheels are on, casters are on, base is done. Let's set this thing upright. Ta da! Tron is upright for the first time in a long time. <laughs> welcome Tron to the arcade. Well, not quite, but welcome to the real world again. All right, time for a little painting today. So I have done several layers of the Bondo glazing resin. It's not gonna get perfectly flat, but it's gonna be much better. And I've got the sides taped off just because I don't wanna splatter any paint onto the side art. So I'm going to be using a roller, a cabinet roller. You may ask, well, is that going to give you a nice smooth finish? Well, no, it's not, but we can sand it back down if we need to. And the original finish on this is actually just a little bit of a texture to begin with. So um, we're going to see how it goes. You might also ask, should you be priming it first? Well, I have primed many, many times like the experts say to do. And on some projects it's perfect. And on others like this kind of cabinetry, I don't get good results out of it because the primer itself goes on really thick and it tends to want to chip off. And then later with the paint, if the paint gets dinged or dented at all, then the primer shows through. If I had black primer, that's one thing. So sometimes I'll use spray primer on a project, uh, a sandable spray primer, and that's great. But on this, I'm just going to roll it on and we'll let it dry and then I can sand it down a little bit and we'll see what happens. All right, so a little change of plans. I did the uh, little cabinet roller first and that put on such a thin coat, you could still see every little imperfection in the wood. And we know we need a little more than that because the wood's not perfect. So I switched to a 3 8 inch nap uh, roller and put on just a little thicker coat that way. You can see it around the edges here. And the sides look really reasonably good. So far it's drying, so the gloss is still a little off. The front is a little more iffy down at the bottom. You can see the different 
sanding areas and things like that. So I'm gonna have to consider whether I need to re-sand that or if another coat will just start to hide that uh, with a more even gloss. All right, this is with the second effort, a little more glazing. You can still see some roller marks, which are fine. I just put this on. Um, but boy, it looks a lot smoother. I'm pretty happy with that. Now my lovely wife, Cindy, has taped some papers together and put them on each side and then used a crayon to outline the edge of the existing art. We're gonna replace this art because it's all torn up actually see it down here at the bottom where it doesn't make the continuous curve or corner like it's supposed to. Same thing over here, got this all marked out. So we're gonna get replacement art that we have to cut to the shape and size because not all cabinets were exactly the same. So now we have a template for this and then we'll be able to remove the art underneath. All right, today I've got some replacement tea molding. This is a textured black. They use this on this game, and on Gorf, and quite a few other games. So this matches the original style on this cabinet. And I'm gonna start in the groove that I made on the bottom. And I just lay some down. And where I have this first corner, I'm gonna take my snips I'm going to cut an angle into the bottom of the T-molding so it can make that turn, I don't know if you can see that or not, without being uh, wanting to push itself back out. And I've got a little white mallet here that I'm going to use to hammer it into place. And I'm going to hope that the groove that I cut is indeed big enough for this to go in. Now it's on to some of the fun stuff, the innards of the Tron. So we're gonna start with the power, and this is the transformer board, and it has a block transformer here, and some giant capacitors here, and I guess kind of something similar to that here. I'm not even sure what exactly this is. And we got our fuses and another box here. All kinds of parts for me to figure out. The big problem is we've got all kinds of clipped wires and I'm gonna have to figure out where these go. So I do have the Tron manual, and I do have the schematics for the transformer board. So I'll be looking that over. Now I have the other power supply board right here that interfaces with this. And this plug's intact, and it looks like it'll go in you know, right in here somehow. There it goes, like that. And then these will output to the game boards, which I have connectors right there. So it looks like these probably go internally to other parts in here, and I'll figure that out. But the bigger worry is I finally got this board out, and I haven't really looked at it closely, but it looks terrible. There is a lot of corrosion. Look at the battery right there. Look at some of those <laughs> solder points. So this thing's gonna be a problem, or could be a problem. We'll figure that out as we go. This blue and this brown apparently come off of the safety switch, which would be a switch on the back door that when the door is off, the machine would automatically turn off. And apparently this brown and orange is part of that whole assembly as well. And it looks like this brown and white and this blue and white go to the fluorescent tubes. 
And then of course we've got to figure out where they all come in and out on the fuses. And um, if this is a terminal block, if the brown and white is fluorescent lights, there are one, two, three, four lights, but blocks for, well, yeah, up to six there. So those were the are probably where the other ones connect to that uh, as they come in as well. So maybe we're getting somewhere. All right, so here we have the main power board and we have lots of damage from the battery. So the battery is alkaline, it spills a basic uh, solution which corrodes everything on the area, in the area around it. So I've got some Zep acidic toilet bowl cleaner and we're gonna use it to kind of soak all these areas like this and try to neutralize all that base. And you can see it all fizz up and foam up I'll zoom in on that just a little bit here. So you can see all the corroded areas in the middle. And you can see down there, like at the battery terminals where it's all fizzing up. So I'm gonna let this soak for about six or seven minutes. And um, I've got a toothbrush, I'll brush it in and then we'll probably put on another coat. Now I've rinsed off all the Zep cleaner and I'm starting the process of using this fiberglass pen, which you can buy them really cheap on Amazon or anywhere else. And I'm just going over where we had a lot of this corrosion and trying to get the top layer off. I wanna see the nice solder underneath all of these. So we just kinda of go back and forth, back and forth. It's nice and scratchy, but it won't tear anything up. And then as we do that, we start to reveal more of the solder. And then what I'm gonna do is any solder that doesn't look good, I'm gonna go ahead and remove it and re-solder those uh, spots. So we want all this to look nice and tidy. I'm gonna work on that. All right, so I have another product that's indispensable and it's the Deoxid D5. And this is a great spray that you can put onto circuitry on edge connectors. It will clean, deoxidize. Um, it doesn't conduct electricity, so you don't have to worry about it shorting across, but it allows electricity to conduct through it by allowing the metal contacts to contact even better. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spray some of this on where I have scraped away, and we're gonna get the next layer of this cleaned up. If I can get a little here. Sometimes I'll put it in a little cup and just dip it out with a brush if I don't wanna get it everywhere. But on this board, it's gonna be okay. We got lots to clean, so I'm gonna spray a little here and there. Now I can use my brush and we'll get in there even better. All right, today is finally the day to start working on this wiring. I've been working on the restoration of the cabinet and I have been working on this power board right here. And I think I've got this in good shape. This is the first step and then this interfaces to this and then this goes to the main circuit board. So we wanna make sure first that we're getting the correct voltages out of this to go to this, and then secondly, that we're getting the right voltages out of this to the board. But for today, my goal is to rehook all these wires up in the way they're supposed to be hooked up. So we've got a bunch of ground wires, we've got wires going to the monitor, we've got wires going to the power switch, to a safety switch, uh, we've got wires going everywhere and they are all cut. So I have, I purchased some additional wiring. This is the right specifications for this cabinet. Most of this is to go to power switches and to the fluorescent lights inside. And then I've got some here, some primary wire that we're gonna use this little thicker, uh, nicer wire that's gonna go directly to the monitor connection to power it up. So I'm gonna start by removing the solder on these wires, getting these wires off, and then putting new wires or just looping them over where I can to this transformer right here. So that's step one. All right, so we've got some new ground wires coming across. That's what these green ones are. 
back through here. They were originally yellow with a green stripe, but we're gonna use plain old green because that's all I have. And we're starting to build a section where we'll have all the ground wires go in here, all the fluorescent uh, brown wires that will eventually go up to the fluorescent fixtures from here. We'll go off these terminals, starting to get these put back together the way I should so that we can have some fuse running across to go to the various parts. So we're making some progress. Now, one of the questions I would have is why did someone do this really mangled bad, <laughs> I guess soldering twisting job on this when they could have just pulled the wire over and soldered it directly to the terminal. So these are the kind of things that make me go, hmm. Now there's a couple tools that I've found completely indispensable doing work like this. One is this vice grip wire stripper. You just put the wire in, squeeze, and you've got the end that you want at the length that you want. I use this over and over and over again. So we do that. This is going to be the soldering end of a ground wire. We'll do the same thing to the other end. So now we've got both ends. That's fine. We have the other tool that we need, which are these crimpers. So they crimp on our connectors. I've got this set of connectors that I got off Amazon at some point in time. And there's two different sizes. There's a bigger spade like this. And that's what we're going to use on these terminals on the ground. So all of these fit right onto that. Then there's the next size down like this. And these actually fit over here on the fluorescent power board. And these also typically, both of these sizes are used in arcade games for the joystick connections, all kinds of different connections. So these are very popular. Then we've got some insulating sleeves we can put on the wire first um, so that after we crimp and we put the wire on, we can slide the sleeve over and it's a non-conductive uh, connection. Why would it matter when all this, you could just touch it anyway and hurt yourself? Um, it doesn't, but it looks nicer and it's more professional. So that's what we're gonna do. And that's what they did originally. I have one of the connectors. They have one of these pink insulators on the end on a crimp on connector. So when we want to crimp a wire, the first thing we do is we take the connector and depending on the thickness of the wire we're crimping to, we can go to different terminals here, but I'm gonna use the middle one for this. And we're going to slide it in. We're going to have it flush with the back of this. We're going to give it one click so that we're ratcheted in. So here we have the connector. Then we're going to bring the wire across. We're going to slide it in until the insulation goes barely into there because we want it to grip the insulation. And then I'm at a bad angle here. Let me move around. We're going to squeeze down. And we give a big pump like that. And when I pull it back out, we have this beautiful crimped end. There we go, now we can see it. And then before we would put it on the wire itself, we would wanna have one of the matching insulators, which we can slide on here. And then as we bring it up, now we have a nice insulated connector. You have to remember if this is already soldered onto something, to put this sleeve on before you do the crimp, otherwise you can't get the sleeve on. So we're gonna take this one, we're gonna run from the power supply over to our ground terminal. And then we have to do the same thing with all of our other ground wires, crimp on the ends. Here's another little mystery. So we've got these, looks like fuse connectors here, and they're not anywhere else. But these originally would have connected to this little board. And I'm not sure exactly why they put these in here, but it just passes a signal from here to here and then from here to there. I guess so that you don't have to do any kind of splicing to the line filter if there's a problem on this side. But anyway, look at that. This one basically burned off so, and there would have been a solder point from here to another one right there, just like this side over here. So I'm just gonna cut these off. I'll put this on here and finish this side. This one, I'll put some kind of quick disconnect until I can get another one of these. The black and white on the board 
go to the monitor. So I've already cut myself a five foot length of wire to run to the monitor. I'm not sure how long we need it to be, but we're gonna make it that long to, for now. And I have the appropriate connector for this particular monitor that I bought. I've bought a few of them for different projects. They're not all the same, so you have to check and see what kind you have on your monitor. And I've got a couple pins. These are 084. There are different sizes of pins, so you also make sure you have the right size pins. So we're gonna do the same trick with our crimper that we did earlier. But these are gonna be for pins. So we're gonna put this in like this. And let's just go ahead and do the white. Get the slide all the way through there, good. And we'll crimp it down and through. And then we take these, and I already marked off which one I think is supposed to be the hot, although for a monitor on AC voltage, it doesn't really matter, or it shouldn't. And then we're gonna push it forward until it pops in. And then now we have one terminal of our connector. So I'm gonna do the other with the black and we're gonna make our monitor cord. I think I've done everything I can do to this. I think I've got it wired up correctly. I've been going by the schematics. Um, one of the easiest ways to test this is that this little connector here should have 12 volts AC, I believe, coming out of it. And I've got it plugged in here. Now, it does worry me that the guy, whoever had it last, put extra fuses in and something's burned off of there, which might mean there's some big failure here, but I'm gonna turn this on and see what happens if anything explodes. Nothing exploded. I hear it humming. There's no fire. No voltage there yet though. So I will troubleshoot. Okay, my troubleshooting consisted of putting the multimeter on the right setting. So this is the 12 volt rail. 13.7 is perfectly normal for a 12 volt. So that is good. All right, 128 volts to the monitor, which is pretty close to household current, a little high, but I don't think it's out of range. So that works. And testing the other voltages coming out of the secondary transformer here, going into the filter. We've got eight volts here, and I had 15 volts on the other, and that's exactly what the schematics say we should have. So it looks like this is good. And now we've come to another moment of truth moment. <laughs> so we have to see if this uh, secondary power board here can put out the correct DC voltages. It was missing a jumper, that JW4, that was gone. I looked it up to see if that's supposed to be removed for some reason, and I did not see any reason for it to be gone. So I put a new jumper wire across that I cut from an extra capacitor that I had. We have the power board here. We think it's putting out the right voltages. It's plugged in. Um, know nothing about this board other than it didn't look to be in great shape. So we're going to see, can this board put out anywhere near 5 volts? Is it going to work? So I'm going to reach over here with the switch, have it ready to turn back off if I hear a big pop or see smoke, and here we go. 6.58. Well, at least it's doing something, but that is too high. And so we will see what we can do uh, to troubleshoot that. Now the good news is we do have 12 volts on the 12 volt line. So that part is working. This potentiometer at VR102, Feels terrible, it hardly turns, it's all crickly crackly. So believe it or not, I don't have just a drop-in replacement by itself, but I do have this other power board that came out of a GORF a long time ago that I held on to forever for who knows why, but there's that same part on it. So I'm gonna take it off of this board and swap it with that one. All right, thanks to the power of the internet, I looked it up. And there's a little resistor I've added here on the big uh, capacitor. And what that does is it provides a little bit of a load that tells this power supply to regulate the voltage. So when it was at 6.5, that was a little odd because that is the typical unregulated voltage that comes in before the power supply regulates it. I can't define exactly what that means, but I just know that's the terminology. And so adding that resistor tells it it has a load and tells it kind of to start working. And as it starts working, then we get this. And with the new uh, potentiometer I put on there, 
then we can, I can dial it right in. So I'm gonna leave it a little bit high, 5.1, so slightly high, because once it goes to the actual Tron board, then the board is gonna suck up some of that and it's gonna go way down. So that's great. I could very smoothly move it up and down through that range. Five volts, perfect, 12 volts, perfect. This is going to work. All right, now that we've got the power supply working as far as we know, it's time to work on the monitor because the progression that I would like to have is get the power transformer working, the power board working, um, get the monitor working, and then we can start doing things like testing the actual circuit boards. So here's the first most important thing when dealing with any monitor is it does need to be discharged. So this area right here is the anode, or a lot of people will call it the cap, there's a lot of high voltage contained in this system and inside the monitor itself that can stay there for a long, long time. So even if it's been unplugged, it can still have a lot of charge. Now I picked this up several months ago and it's been out of a machine forever, so I doubt it has any charge at all. But we're gonna play it safe. The way I usually do this, I have a long screwdriver. I'm gonna slide it under this cap. I'm gonna hold it against the frame of this. I go down. I can actually lift it up for a second until I feel the metal in the inside and I'm going to lay it against the metal out here. And any charge that's still built up should end up going through the frame and dissipating. And that way I will not get shocked. Now that looks a little better and it's time to go ahead and take this cap off. And I'm going to pry it up to where I can see the metal and I'm going to do one more sanity check to make sure there's no charge left and there's not. So I can look in here. I'm going to go in with one hand. Don't touch the clip. I don't want to touch it anyway. I'm going to give it a little squeeze and see if I can get this to pop up. There it goes. So these two clips down here were really embedded in there. It was hard to get out, but I got it. You don't want to tear anything up. Be nice and careful. Now, in order to get this chassis out, to do a cap kit on it and refresh it, there are some things we need to take apart. So there's always going to be a two wire cable coming from the monitor. That's the degaussing strap. So the degaussing strap is this big strap goes all the way around. It controls the magnetic fields around the monitor. Basically, if you've ever seen a TV, you turn it kind of funny and you get some weird colors in the corner. Well, this is taking care of that demagnetization for you. There's gonna be another one that's gonna to run to this neck board. So we're gonna very gently wiggle back and forth and pry off the neck board, just like that. Sometimes this wire that comes across is on a plug. Sometimes it's soldered to the board like it is in this case. So I'm gonna have to desolder it either here or up here where it connects because this can't be, can't remain connected. We're also gonna have a strap for the yoke. It's gonna be down in here like this as well. So I'm gonna wiggle back and forth. And get that connector up. So it's always a four prong, red, blue, green, yellow, sometimes with a brown instead of uh, yellow or green, one, something like that. And then this goes to the flyback, which is gonna to stick to this. Uh, we've got, looks like that one, one more back here to get. And it looks like this, just another little connector. And I think we're pretty good. So we'll start unclipping some of the cable ties and desolder one of these wires. Just like that. Like that. Stuck on and we have the chassis out. The electronics part is out. And now we're left with our tube and our frame.
All right, it's cap kit time. And if you've watched my other videos, you know that I almost always do a cap kit on the monitor chassis. And the caps on the monitor are these tall, sometimes not so tall, sometimes they're little ones in here, cylindrical objects that are all over monitors and other electronics. And these are capacitors and they hold a charge, basically keep the charge even as it's flowing around. Um, think of them as kind of on-site batteries that make sure that the right charge goes at the right time. And as they get older, especially these early 1980s monitor chassis, these start to dry out and that really affects the quality of the picture. So the picture can sometimes uh, have curls and lines, sometimes just the colors are bad, things like that. So we have these cap kits that we can order that have a selection of all the caps for a certain monitor. So this says Wells Gardner 4900, K4900, which is what this monitor chassis is. And the way I know that is, well, first of all, there's not that many different monitor chassis, and this is a pretty popular one, so it can be identified just by its overall appearance and arrangement. And also on the monitor itself, on the, uh, the big part we just took this out of, the frame, it has a sticker on there saying it's a Wells Gardner K4900, 19K. So the 19 means it's a 19 inch. So what we're gonna do is we're going to desolder every one of these caps off this board, and then we're gonna take this kit one by one and go through and solder brand new ones on. All right, so how does this work? Well. Each capacitor is labeled on the board. So this is C201. And I like to start from big and then go to small if I can. It makes it easier to keep these arranged. And this one, we look on our list. And C201 is the first one on the list. It's 1,000 microfarads at 25 volts. So then I come over here, and I've already kind of searched it out. Here's 1,000 at 25. Now. The key with these is you could use something that's rated higher. So if this said 1,000 at 35, that would be fine. The voltage can be higher. But the microfarads, the 1,000, pretty much needs to be the same. So sometimes you'll get a kit and it'll have slightly higher voltages just because that's what's available. That's okay. There is a plus leg and a minus leg. See the minus? And this would be the plus. The plus leg is also longer. It is important to put these in the right direction, the right polarity. Otherwise, you can have some big problems. There are a few uh, capacitors that are bipolar. It doesn't matter which direction, but not very many. Now, this whole process is tremendously easier if you have a vacuum desoldering gun. And I love this one, this Hacko. I've had it for quite a while. It's got different tips. I've got the tip on it I like. It's got a button. It'll vacuum the solder up into this chamber. Now, on the back of the board, which I'm gonna have to look again. So we can actually see right there, C201, there's a plus and a minus labeled on the back. They're not always labeled like this, but this one's labeled nicely. And then we're just gonna set this on top to where it goes through the back of that. Give it a little suck, a little twist around. And then we're gonna do the other half of it, if I can find it. It's hard to hold the camera and do this at the same time. I missed that one. Let me change my angle. It's got to go all the way through there. There it goes. Just like that. So now both legs are free, and now we can pop that cap out. And there it is. Also note that on this side of the board, there will often be a little white dot or some other indicator for what the negative it is. It even has the plus on this side. So from either side you look, you should be able to figure out which way to put it in. So there's our new cap in place. We've got the minus on the right-hand side, so the line matches up with that dot. And I've pulled it through and then I've bent the legs over. This is so I can keep it flush with the top of the board while I do my soldering back here. Now we want to okay. solder the new one in. And so we take our soldering iron, and it's nice to have a nice soldering iron too, and we're gonna hold it right on the pad, the metal pad, and the metal wire coming up from the cap. We're gonna heat it up first, and we're going to set our solder in, give it a little push, pull back off, and we'll make beautiful little solder joints. And we just take our flush cutters, pop that up, and that one, 
And then we're done with that C201. So I'm going to mark it off my list. Okay, big test. So we have the rebuilt transformer board here that's gonna power the monitor that I just rebuilt. And I've got this test pattern generator that I'm gonna turn on, and it's gonna give the monitor an image to display because we don't have the boards ready, we're not to that point yet. We just wanna see if this monitor powers up and if it shows a picture. And they always make me super nervous because they are high voltage, they can do all kinds of things to pop and break, and I don't even know if everything's all set as far as the power supply giving it a good 120 volts and all that. But I have it grounded to the board and I'm ready to give it a go. So I'm gonna count down from three. Three, two, one. Okay, I heard crackling and popping. That's always good, that means there's high voltage in the monitor. So here it comes, and we have TPG blue screen. Oh, thank goodness. Wow, that's actually a pretty good picture. We go through different modes, we can do our adjustments, but it looks like it's adjusted pretty well. There's one other setting to check on your monitor when you're done, and it depends on the type of monitor, but there's a B plus voltage that needs to be in a really close range and in this case this monitor is supposed to be 130 volts and we're at 129.5 so that's fine we don't want it to be wildly higher than the rated value because that can start giving off x-rays and i don't really want to get x-rayed every time i play tron after a long day of rebuilding that and fixing that and rebuilding this and bringing up the main circuit boards I've actually got it all hooked together. So in theory, when I turn the switch on, we should see Tron. If that happens, I'm gonna be thrilled. I have not checked, I did not cheat. We're gonna try this right now. Okay. I didn't hear them, oh, there it is. Oh, and there is Tron. Although we uh, have some uh, hold issues. Okay, I'm going to fix that. Well, that is pretty well amazing. Of course, it's sideways because the monitor is sideways. Now I'm gonna take apart the control panel that came with it because we're gonna put a new overlay over the top and make it look nice. And it has the wrong joystick. So while this does have a functional joystick with a fire button on it, it's not the original. We have that separate. We're gonna replace that. These we're gonna clean up and keep and this we're gonna clean up and keep, the spinner. So time to disassemble. Now, 
oh, there's always got to be a problem. The problem is I just want to pull this joystick up and out, but it's got this thin dust cover on the middle of it, which means either I have to cut this dust cover off, which I might, or figure out how to take this top part apart so I can slide the entire shaft through. Oh, I'll get it figured out. All right, so anytime I'm polishing small metal pieces, I like to use these discs with a Dremel. And these polishing wheels have different grits on them all the way up to one where you can put on some fine polish at the end. So I'm just gonna go through with the different uh, grits, start cleaning up these coin slot inserts. to take the control panel overlay off of this. It's kind of weird. There's actually some color under the remaining adhesive sticker here. But what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be heating it up with a heat gun as I go and just manually scraping it off. So it just takes some time. Now I've got the control panel cleaned up, sanded down, and you can see there are some divots here where the bolts go in to hook the spinner and the joystick on on the other side. So in the factory, it looks like they covered them with an extra pad and then put the overlay over it. We're gonna fill this in with a little JB weld. We've also got a problem where the last person put in a new joystick and drilled holes through the control panel to put bolts through from the top. So I've got some tape, clear tape, up on the bottom part of this and we're going to put some JB weld in there so we can smooth that off. And this is also when we put the new overlay on that you can't push down into it and dent it or tear it.
All right, I got it all wired back together, at least the uh, main electronics. So it goes up to the monitor up here. I think it's all set for a test run. All right, the board's running at five volts, which is what we want. Monitor's on. And there's the game in the cabinet for the first time. Hooray! All right, I finally managed to get Tron into the arcade and we got a little workshop space for it right here. Uh, I think this morning what I'm gonna do is start really getting things done on the top. So we have two speakers to wire in. We have that uh, fluorescent light fixture that has an LED bulb into it, in it uh, to wire up. And there's a switch way in the back that I added that it needs to be wired in as well. So those are good projects for a Sunday morning. I pulled some wires through. They go all the way down to the power board and I've just got them hanging here so I can put an ending on it, a connection on it. So I've got my tools for that. I've got my wire strippers and my crimpers and we're gonna make a connector. All right, so I've added female pins to here and we have a male connector here, and I have my own connector for it. So what I'm gonna do is just lay it in place, match up the colors on the wires. So we have blue here. Slide that in. Green in the middle, and brown on this side. I'm gonna unconnect it, and push these up and in the rest of the way till they snap. Just like that. Now we've made a connector. And we can hook it on right like that. Good. And then I can run all these wires back and down the cabinet. All right, so I got it wired up all the way down to the base. I'm gonna flip the switch on and see if the light comes on. Hey, there it is. So now we have a marquee light. Fantastic. All right, so now I'm gonna wire up the speaker and the speaker goes into this amp board to this connector right here, which I happen to have an extra of because this is the same pattern as a monitor connector, a video cable connector. So I had an extra on hand and it uses these special Trifurcon pins. So we're gonna make a little uh, connector for it today. And I've got the wiring here for the speaker so I know what colors I wanna use. I don't have the original wires, but I've got something close enough. All right, I've got the speakers wired in. I have a problem though, but I'm gonna start a game. Uh, let's see if we can find it. There, and I've got a start button down here. My problem is, is that this speaker works fine. That speaker, if I hook it up, just buzzes super loud. So uh, there may be something wrong with the sound amp board. We've got them hooked up at least, and I'm gonna work, I think, on the marquee next.
All right, a little package from eBay here. As we wrap up some of the last things, it's a coin box. I've got the side art copied over, traced on to the template in wet erase marker so that I can see the lines. And I'm gonna cut it to shape. All right, I've got these taped back on with painter's tape where they are going to be positioned. Just like that. And now the tricky part, putting them on so they stay. So I am going to do the wet method with this project, which means I've got a spray bottle with some soapy water in it. And I am going to spray the sides down just a little bit so I have a little wiggle room to move these around and to help push the air bubbles out. Normally I do this dry, but today we're going to try wet. The side art wasn't very easy to put on because of having to tuck it under that groove, but it went on nicely. And you can see with the black light, uh, that really makes things pop in there. So I like that. All right, today is the day to put the overlay on the control panel. I've got it sitting over here. Something like this. So we're going to get it set up and arranged and we'll peel the back off and we'll put it on. Today's a good day to get this inner shroud cleaned up. Looks like some mud daubers have been in there. Plenty of dirt and grime. All right, it's all done. Now we've got a little bit of damage right here. But other than that, it's in 
good shape. It's got some scratches on the plexi in the back. We'll see how it looks. I'd like to use the original if I can. I also got a couple cats out here that helped. Right, Goomba? Right, Zora? Okay, I'm pretty excited. We've got the glass here that goes over the monitor. It's a piece I ordered from Peninsula Glass Company because none of the local glass companies could do tempered glass for me. So I'm gonna cut the box open. There it is. Nice shiny piece of glass. Just need to clean it off a little and then we'll try it in. Now when I bought this joystick, the wires had been cut here, and when I bought the harness separately, the wires have been cut here. So luckily I have the connector. So I'm just gonna trim these and I'm gonna solder them together and uh, add a little heat shrink tubing and hopefully be good as new. All right, so I got my multimeter set to continuity. I should be able to hit it. Looks like our connector works. Well, I'm still missing a few nuts and bolts here and there couple screws, but I can run and get those. Everything is in place, hooked back up. All right, I got the kinks worked out in the joystick wiring. Everything was rotated basically 90 degrees, so I decided to move some wires around. I've added this layer of foam insulation on the top. That's going to close up the little gap down in here. And um, I spray painted the top of it black the other day when I had the spray paint out so that it would look nice. So I am all for using original parts, but I think if they had had access to these glowing joystick shells back in day, the day, that's what they would have used. And it's just too impressive not to use. So I'll keep the old joystick, but I'm gonna swap out the shell. Well, that's how the plexiglass looks after 600 grit sandpaper. There's one little spot that's too deep for me to grind down into. I hope this polish is back up. That looks much better. All right, now we're getting pretty close. Got the acrylic polished up. The translite behind it looking better. Joystick is now glowing. It's a few little details left.
And here I have a kit from highscoresaves.com or highscoresave.com. And it's a kit to modify the Tron board. And what it will do is we'll have both Tron and the game Satan's Hollow on the same chips, basically. So we're going to modify this board so it can run both games in the cabinet. All right, so there it is, and uh, we're at the default, highscoresaves.com, and now it's on free play because of the kit. So let me kill the light back here. And it looks like the game is working fine. Now, the it has a menu system that we can bring up, and we can get rid of the high score saves. We can go to the main settings. Uh, we can go down, change it to where it will say midway, all kinds of other things we can do. All right, we'll go back to the main menu and save. Now let's try to switch to Satan's Hollow. I'm going to hold down the start button. And let go. Okay, now we can go down and pick Satan's Hollow which I have never played before in my life. Well, there it is. We're down to a few details here to get this completely finished up. And one is I need a power switch up here. And I had a switch in bracket that I bought, but it turns out that that switch does not work. So I bought a replacement switch that I'm gonna use in the same bracket. And I've put a couple connectors on so that we can disconnect it. So that we can get that up. Then we have some ground wires we need to run. We need to run one from the switch plate, one from the control panel. And then I think the wiring is done. Now we have all the wiring routed, got all the ground wires in, got everything hooked up with some little brackets to the sides, running neatly down to our power supply and transformer. I still have to make a mount for this uh, stack of boards over here, but we've got everything else looking nice and neat. Well, it's a beautiful afternoon here. And it is a good day to cut everything out on the back doors. So we have a couple vent openings here. And up here we're going to have a lock. So we're going to have an inner diameter for the lock to go through and an outer one to put the outside of the lock flush. So I'm going to grab, I've got a drill, a jigsaw, some bits. We'll make it happen. I've made some holes here on the corners with my spade for uh, getting the jigsaw in easily. So that's gonna be the next step, cutting out all these vents. So after looking at everything, I wasn't particularly thrilled by my freehand cuts. You can see how it kind of goes up and down. As straight as I thought I was keeping it, I wasn't keeping it that straight. So I've recut, and what you can do is you can get one of these clamps that comes down. You can fit it on any size board. 
and you can clamp it down and then you can run your tools, your power tools, along that line and get a perfectly straight line. So I'm just gonna go through and refresh these and get them exactly straight. Now this is an interesting thought. I sanded these back down. I'll have to paint back in the inside of these a little bit. But sanded the doors down because they were just a little too rough textured. Let's get the angle here. Now they look like old Tron doors. <laughs> and now I'm a little torn. If I leave them looking like old doors so they look authentic, or if I put another coat of paint on them so they look really shiny. I'm gonna have to figure that one out. Now I've got these back pieces looking mostly the way I want. I've sanded them back down a little bit, uh, which made, has made them smooth, and also given them a little bit of aging where some of the uh, particle board can show through, and I am fine with that because that's how the whole rest of the back looks. Uh, I've also got some screen here, some aluminum gutter screen, and what I'm gonna do is cut it into some pieces. They're gonna go on the insides of these to keep people from putting their fingers in, just like original. So we'll cut those on and staple them in. And just like that, we have the screen and we have the side done, the bottom part. Now I replaced this sound amp on this side. This is a side that just has a nonstop, super loud buzz. And that didn't fix it, surprisingly. I had tested these other components, the resistors and some of the other parts here, and even take, took the capacitors out and checked them separately. But in circuit, this capacitor is much different than this one. This has a much lower resistance across it. So I've got a replacement one. It's a higher voltage, but the same uh, ohms. And that's fine. We can do that. We just can't change the ohms on it. So I'm gonna swap this one in for that and see if we get rid of the loud buzz. All right, let's see if that did anything. Nope. Still just huge loud noise. And there we have the bottom door in place. Looks nice and authentic. Here's what the back of the doors look like with the screen on them. This one I did not cut the channel deep enough with the Forstner bit. So the lock didn't go through quite far enough. So I've recut that, so I've got to repaint it. Now back here on the game itself, where this is gonna lock, someone at some point in time just pried the whole door out and broke this kind of thin piece of plywood through here. So what I'm gonna do with that is I'm gonna put a metal plate behind it and I'm gonna re-glue all the wood back together so that's nice and tight. And then I've got some screws I'll put in from the front to hold that metal piece. So that way when the lock slides up, it'll catch that metal piece there. And then if we wanna patch in this missing part right here, we can do that with about anything, it'll look nice. And here we have the back doors in place. Kind of scuffed down, sanded down, look similar to the old wood that's already on there. Now I'm still working on the sound amplification problem where we have a loud speaker buzzing. And last weekend, I took off each one of these blue tantalum capacitors and tested them individually and they seemed to be fine. But when I put them back on, I switched sides. And then when I did, the opposite speaker became the buzzing speaker. So that tells me that one of these was actually bad. So I've ordered a couple of replacements from Mauser. I've got them right there. So I'm gonna swap them in and see if that takes care of it once and for all. All right, this was our speaker that was buzzing. I've unhooked the other one so we can test it separately. And it is working. So you might notice this extra little band of graphical garbage here on the corner. I've kind of ignored it so far, but I think today's the day I'm going to work on that. And we're going to see if we can get to the bottom of what's causing it. Now what I'm guessing on the video glitch problem is we do have these four RAM, video RAM chips here. And because we rearranged the boards when we did the high score kit, the video board is easy to get to. It's right here on the outside. So I have some replacement RAM chips from Twisty Wrist Arcade, and I'm gonna try them in today, and I'm gonna see if it's these. 
Or, as I've seen online, sometimes the sockets themselves underneath are kind of iffy. So we'll check all that out. Nope, didn't do it. It's still there, so not the RAM chips themselves. Okay, well, it wasn't over there, but we have four more RAM spots over here. So I'm going to use the RAM that we took out from this spot and stick it in this spot and see if that changes anything. Well, that didn't work. Still got our same problem. All right, so I've managed to play with the monitor settings a bit and just make it wide enough so that you can't see those pixels on the side. I think this works better. I'm gonna leave it like this. I think it could be a problem with the monitor and not the boards anyway, and I can explore that down the road if I want. And now we have this nice little stand for the circuit boards. This little metal plate at the top that we remove if we wanna take the board set out. One of the last things I need to do to complete this project is make this side art look better. Now I could have ordered a new piece of side art for each side, but I don't mind them if they're a little scuffed up, a little beat up. I mean, it's kind of part of the charm of having an older game. So what I've got are these paint markers, oil-based paint markers. I've used them before on things. Um, they re It really, really sticks. So kind of like a Sharpie, but even better for going over vinyl. There's a few spots up here you can see I've already done where the black is a little glossy but it's also much better than having the white look like it does on these corners here. After I get it all done, I plan on putting a coat of wax over it and uh, basically blend all the shininess in. So we're gonna make this look better. I still will put a coat of wax on here to get the sheen the same, but that looks, you know, it's not perfect, but much better, certainly acceptable to me. Well, that's a wrap on this restoration video. I hope you enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed putting together this old classic and I'm really happy to have it in my arcade. Uh, perhaps now I can learn how to play it properly and not lose quarters to it immediately like I did when I was a kid. Um, I'd like to thank the people on the arcade collecting forums for their advice on repairs along the way and also hunting down old parts out of their bins and getting them to me so that I could actually put this thing back together. Um, as always, uh, I appreciate your likes and subscribes, so please do that if you haven't already, and your comments. So if you have anything you want to say, please feel free. I like to interact with everyone. Also, if there's something else you saw in the video that you'd like to hear more about, give me ideas for future videos, leave that in the comments as well. Um, I have another video coming soon. It should be the pole position restoration video and you may have seen it in the background while I was working on this one. I'm anxious to get that completed and out to you as well. But until then, keep on gaming.
It's almost October and not one damn banana? 